Welcome to Artist Books Out Loud. And as Ken said, this is the inaugural program. And uh, so it's just extra exciting to be here. And I want to thank Bima. And I also want to thank Cynthia and all of you for helping to make this happen, and especially Linda. Uh, for joining me tonight. Um, my name is Catherine Alice Michaels, Ken introduced me, and I'm the Associate Director of the Cynthia Sears Artist Books Collection. And I co-curate the shows in the Sherry Grover Gallery with Cynthia. Um, Linda Beards honoring us this evening. Uh, she's a beloved Bainbridge Island poet. She's received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, a MacArthur Genius Award certified, as Ken said, <laughs> and many other deserving accolades. Um, she's here tonight not to read her own poetry, but to generously share the creative writing of others from the Artist Books Collection. The collection has over 2,800 titles in it now, and uh, because Cynthia and I couldn't figure out how to rotate them all through the Sherry Grover Gallery in our lifetime, we are now bringing them into the auditorium in little piles to share with you through these readings. Um, I was wishing we'd sort of suggested everyone come in their pajamas and that we just followed it up with cookies and milk and that would have been perfect kind of like reading and bedtime kind of thing. Um, but instead, after the reading, Linda and I are going to sit here at the table and chat with you a bit if you have questions, responses to the artist books, or need a second look at anything. Um, and we're going to set the books up if you want a closer look. Um, we have a keepsake broadside, one of Linda's poems called The Evening Star to give away today if you'd like one. They were letterpress printed by Partners in Print in Seattle. And um, there, Cynthia's gift to you. Mm -hmm. Sarah White is a book artist recently relocated from New Orleans to Portland. She has an MFA from the University of Alabama, known for their superb book arts program. The text and images in the book were written, designed, letterpress printed on handmade paper, and bound by Sarah White with support from several people, she thinks, in the book. The photographic images were taken from a pamphlet, These Were Our Homes, compiled in 1954 by Elizabeth Cousins Rogers in an effort to publicize the unjust destruction of the homes along the Batcher. Much of the written information came from the Batcher Dwellers Association records, uh, 1949 to 1958. It is quite common in artist books for the artists to create both text and image, though the other titles we share tonight uh, won't share this feature, this model. Riverine, uh, it has this wrapper, it comes in a sleeve and then it has a wrapper and in the wrapper it says, this book is dedicated to Batcher dwellers, to all who live fluidly with awareness and care for the shifting ground beneath our feet. As I turn the pages of the book, you'll notice how the feet of the pages lift and lower. There's different heights. And uh, a house rises out of the water, or maybe it's an extension of the river itself. Uh, texts will appear in different, texts in different voices appear in different colors. White describes Riverine as a fractured essay. Uh, which suits the subject of changing ground, the creative and destructive power of the fluctuating water levels, and the human detritus that flows from mountains to mouth of the Mississippi. The artist's hand-drawn lines and the Batcher's photographic history touch in places. I am not sure which seems more solid, which more ghostly. <laughs> So now I'll open the book. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. This is Riverine. Oh, God, God. It has this beautiful little net print here for the Batcher dwellers. Here's one of the photographs she talks about that comes from historical records.
New Orleans is a place where solid ground denotes pavement, and even the sidewalks shift and sink. Like most coastal cities, it straddles the line between water and land, settling for mud. Here, people settle on mud. Flux is palpable and constant beyond the levee wall. The muddy sliver of shoreline between a levee and river is called the batcher. Dictionaries struggle to define the slippery place, describing it as a river or seabed raised to the surface. And here's where the text will change colors. In low water, you can stand here. Homes stand here on stilts and appear to walk in strong currents. To live here is to know the importance of long limbs. Batcher, a battle between wet and dry, an unmappable landscape, terra incognita. Born of the Mississippi, its alluvial sediments collect and build and wash away. Then I love the way the book will open and collapse, and it makes me think about how the waters <coughs> come up and down. Mud molds to the hands that hold it, stains the hands. How can one own it? Where there is dirt, there is someone to claim it. The river deposits sediment, and human settlement follows. On the batcher, ownership is nebulous changing with the shoreline. Some arrive by boat and leave on foot. And you can see how the pages go up. And we have the photographic and drawn elements. Water laps, the, water laps the raised pilings. Algae grows, barnacles feed. Sky, all sky, nothing but sky. A liminal existence aloft the camp's peak above the levee wall. To live, on the long, to live on the bachelor long term, elevated homes are necessary. The higher the structure, the safer it is from flood water. During the early to mid 20th century, the bachelor was comprised of residents who owned little aside from their tall dwellings. In low moments, newspapers described the residents as river rats or caricatured them as a tourist attraction. Building materials are forged along the river. Sediment, flotsam, and debris flow from Minnesota to Louisiana, with tributaries touching 31 states. Several homes along the Batcher exhibit objects washed ashore. In 1954, Hundreds of residents were displaced as houses were burned or bulldozed in the name of levee repair. Years of lawsuits yielded no compensation for the loss of legally built bachelor homes. Aside from an archive of letters appealing to city officials and a booklet published by the bachelor dweller themselves, there is little documentation of this history. We go out on canoe, dwarfed by barges, to check trout lines, hooks baited with shrimp, anchored to their bottom with antique window weights. Nothing today. It might be noted that people who have survived the floods of Old Man River for 14, 24, even 33 years, perched on their 24-foot pilings, seeing the yellow waters so often swirl around their kitchen linoleum while they continue cooking supper, won't be stumped by legal difficulties. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I didn't know you needed that. 
An egret is here in the morning to pluck shrimp from the shallows. Her movement is slow, graceful, violent. Look up, horizon drawn by industry, pink blue at your feet. A rainbow flickers on the surface of the water. Both wild and industrial, the batcher hums and buzzes with electrical wires, insects, footsteps and bicycles on the levee, the rustling of brush, bird songs, the passing of a train, the moan of a barge. Remnants of past lives resurface now and then, rusted washing machines, light bulbs filled with river water, blackberries line the river, driftwood collects and forms curved patterns in the marsh, the levee rises still. We set our nets, the river meanders. So that's Riverine, and now yeah. to Linda. Yeah. The book that I want to start with, with you, is called Morpho <laughs> Terrestre, and it is the book that has not been shown in the Sherry Grover Gallery, and I was drawn to it, well, you'll see why. It consists of seven poems by Emily Wilson, and four images by Sarah Langworthy. The poems revolve around an extremely close examination of the natural world, referencing specific moments in nature and the things found in those moments. Emily Wilson said that her poems were inspired by the 17th century treatise Micrographia which looked at studies using the then new technology of the microscope. Quote, I like to think of the poems as the result of some imaginative transit or trade taking place between a moment of physical observation and remembered residues of it, its associative promptings. Of the images, Sarah Langworthy said, the prints are multi-layered, employing both relief printing and hand-painted sumi ink washes. The printed elements were made from a series of photopolymer plates, which were from plants, stems, and sticks. I want to call attention to beauty in unremarkable places. This is what I love the gray of wet concrete seen through worn out holes in a leaf on the sidewalk, light reflected on the wall in mid-afternoon. The printing was done using a Vandercook proof press. The printing process itself has more in common with drawing or collage than with strategic letterpress printing. The images are hidden behind gatefolds, giving the viewer the opportunity to experience the text itself without my own interpretation getting in the way. So I, I picked this up it, it, just to hold it. It's just, it's so beautiful and it's leather and fabulous and I'm so glad to give it back because <laughs> all these weeks I've been thinking oh don't hurt it don't don't spill anything on it don't so we start and and uh, yes so if you look on the yeah, screen we haven't quite help gotten there move it up. If you, I mean if you can move the book sure up, though, that'd be great how's that good better great. yeah oh Hunter's gonna give us a camera adjustment <laughs> Hunter just gave us an image of nothing. It's a blank, a totally blank page. <laughs> so here are one, the first gatefold. Oh, first there are very modest names at the top on the left, if you can see them. Then the first gatefold 
what Sarah was talking about, the plants, the sticks, the vines. We move along, and this is the title poem of the book. It's Morpho Terrestre. The blue morpho is a fantastically beautiful butterfly. It is so stunning that it's now endangered because people want to collect it. Um, what I noticed when I opened this is what Sarah has done on the gatefold is this fabulous blue wash. If you can see that, it always, the, this color blue is the same color that I noticed when I looked the blue morpho butterfly up. And so the gesture, to me anyway, as a reader, look as an observer, is that the butterfly is everywhere in these vines, in, in this foliage. The butterfly is pinned through, the thor through its thorax, and from that point the wings read in canted panels, releasing the stored chromes, the inner mechanics. The name affixes to earth, the wings barely do. Watch it blues of the tinging substance trapped in the plates of Muscovy glass, nudged free in time with elegant, elegant twists of the nib. The design of the wing permits of its partial retraction, vague shallowing folds, wing worked up from a packet of dampened acetates. So there can be semblance to begin with at night against the bark of a tree. Brush of the foot to the model bark, filling in patches of drab on the celadon vine, the minimum pattern permitting. The legs have been plucked, feelers sealed back, sealed back from the jaws with dark glue, makeshift road of the sleeper plied through the gorge. move along in the book, oftentimes the poems do not have images to accompany them. Other times they certainly do. I wasn't going, I'm not going to read this one, but um, beautiful blues used again. The one I want to finish with is Protea and here, the bracts of that plant are the, sub are the declared subject. Um, here, the fold out shows a bract on the left and another echo bract on the right. The bracts drying and sharpening bits of the bloom cured, revolute tools to do the scoring. Things turn in on themselves, surfaces that were hidden inside plumage, jester, starlight, flame spike, gnarled shuttlecock, the botched brokerage. Linnea saw the sketched bud, the recondite continents came, two cliffs, opposite hinged, along which sugar birds browse for scarab beetles. Seeds snag inside the pins and are borne off. The leather-lipped jackfire feels for stems underground. Garnet shrill in the schist, agrodite flock operates up gutters like dense moss. Lumbering parts meet rarefied parts and suffer each, uh, each the other, otherwise curled on the keels. Half the time, what was I thinking, undoing through the cup around the rim? The disparate wrought exposures extremely formed, so I can't picture it myself. 
at the foot of the bed, against the yellow wall, near the bowl of change and ticket stubs, the grayish, hoodish train of packed anthers, mock anthers, wildly plush, wreathed in the sheath. So we're going to stop with this book. We have a couple more to do. So the next book I want to share is called The Lake of Beauty, and it was made by Stephanie Wolf. Wolf is an artist and educator who's made many books, including this one. When she, uh, this one, though, she made as an artist in residence at the Jaffe Center for Book Arts at Florida Atlantic University in 2015. For Lake of Beauty, Wolf borrowed the text from a much longer prose poem called Towards Democracy by Edward Carpenter, who lived from 1844 to 1929. Towards Democracy is a very long poem about spiritual democracy. Carpenter was an English utopian socialist, poet, philosopher, anthologist, an early activist for gay rights and prison reform, and those are not related, um, whilst advocating <laughs> vegetarianism, to be clear, uh, whilst advocating vegetarianism and taking a stance against vivisection. He was an early advocate of sexual liberation. Um, we wanted to get sex in here somehow. Um, he had an influence on both D.H. Lawrence and Sri Aurobindo, and inspired E.M. Forster's novel Maurice. In 2008, Carpenter was called the gay godfather of the British left by Fiona McCarthy in The Guardian. You know, he deserves that kind of interest, I think. <laughs> On my first read of this text, I was reminded of Walt Whitman, who I've since learned had a great influence along with the Bhagavad Gita on Carpenter's ideas as expressed in Toward Democracy. So I just find him like really interesting and really compelling um, when I read this to really want to know more about him. What comes in this fancy little wood box. We can have the screen now. So, like, this is really interesting to me that the artist did this. Put that aside. And then this is also a wrapper that is around the book, much like Riverine, uh, which is also interesting. And then the artist has used a series of circles just in different relationships to each other to go along with the text of this book. The Lake of Beauty. Let your mind be quiet, realizing the beauty of the world and the immense, the boundless treasures that it holds in store. All that you have within you, all that your heart desires, all that your nature so specially fits you for, that or the counterpart of it waits embedded in the great whole for you. It will surely come to you. Yet equally surely, not one moment before its appointed time will it come. All your crying and fever and reaching out of hands will make no difference. Therefore, do not begin that game at all. <laughs> Do not recklessly spin the waters of your mind in this direction and in that, lest you become like a spring, lost and dissipated in the desert. But draw them together into a little compass and hold them still, so still. And let them become clear so clear, so limpid, so mirror-like. At last, the mountains and the sky shall glass themselves in peaceful beauty, and the antelope shall descend to drink and gaze at his reflected image, and the lion to quench his thirst. And love himself shall come and bend over and catch his own likeness 
in you. This is a complete departure from the lyric that you've been hearing, the lyricism. This is a book called Apologia. The text is by Barry Lopez. If that name sounds familiar, he's won many, many awards, including the National Book Award for Arctic Dreams, finalist for the National Book Award for Of Wolves and Men, Apologia describes a road trip during which Lopez removed from the roadway the bodies of animals killed by automobiles. The 23 woodblocks were carved on poplar by Robin Eschner over a period of six years. Charles Hobson designed and organized the edition, and many others assisted in printing, hinging, and binding the book. Enclosed in a folder on the back cover is a tire tread print made on a topographic map of Wyoming by Barry Lopez using the ink tire of Barry's Toyota 4Runner, the vehicle driven on the journey from Oregon to Indiana that's chronicled in this book. When um, we're all done, and that won't be too long, I have one more to do after this, we're going to open this book, and it's an accordion book. Spread it out on the table there, and you can come and take a much closer look at the wood, the wood cuts. And if you want to, at that tire print, that's appealing. This is, this is hard because this is huge and heavy, and so I'm going to do the best I can. There's kind of little wires in the way and but we'll we'll see i'll try to keep it up as high as i can how are we doing yeah, is that pretty good thank you okay the very beginning a few miles east of home in the cascades i slow down and pull over for two <laughs> raccoons sprawled still as stones in the road I carry them to the side and lay them in sunshot, wind-blown grass on the barrow pit. In eastern Oregon, along US 20, black-tailed jackrabbits lie like welts of sod, three, four, then a fifth. By the bridge over Jordan Creek, just shy of the Idaho border, in the drainage of the Ohi River, a crumpled adolescent porcupine leers up almost maniacally over its blood-flecked teeth. I carry each one away from the tarmac into a cover of grass or brush out of decency, I think, and worry. Who are these animals? Their lights gone out. What journeys have fallen apart here? I just have two excerpts. Darkness rises in the valleys of Idaho, east of Grandview, south of the Snake River. Night hawks swoop <coughs> the roads for gnats, silent on the wing as owls. On a descending curve, I see two of them lying soft as clouds in the road. I turn around and come back, the sudden slowing down and my K turn at the bottom of the hill draw the attention of a man who steps away from a tractor a dozen yards from where the birds lie. I can tell by his step the suspicious tilt of his head that he is wary vaguely proprietary. Offended or irritated, he may throw the birds back into the road when I leave. So I wait, subdued like a penitent, a body in each hand. 
He speaks first, a low voice, a deep murmur weighted with awe. He has been watching these flocks feeding just above the road for several evenings. He calls them whippoorwills. He gestures for a carcass. How odd, yes, the way they concentrate their hunting right on the road, I say. He runs a finger down the smooth arc of the belly and remarks on the small whiskered bill. He pulls one long wing straight out, but not roughly. He marvels. He glances at my car, baffled by this out-of-state courtesy. Two dozen nighthawks careen past, back and forth at arm's length, feeding at our height and lower. He asks if I would mind, as if I owned it, if he took the bird up to show his wife. She's never seen anything like this. He's fascinated, not close. I trust later he will put it in the fields, not throw the body in the trash, a whirligig. I just wanted to point out here, um, on the opposite page is actually making reference to um, a little bird, a sage sparrow, but you can see how the, the wood cutting artist has the hands and the little bird, the gesture toward a bird's face there with the beak. Always in these I had the sense of motion, moving like wind moving along a highway, the trees. East of Lusk, Wyoming in Nebraska, I stop for a badger. I squat on the macadam to admire the long claws, the perfect set of its teeth and the broken jaw, the ramulose shading of its fur, how it differs slightly, as does every badger's, from the drawings and pictures in the field guides. A car drifts toward us over the prairie, coming on in the other lane, a white 1962 Chevrolet station wagon. The driver slows to pass. In the bright sunlight, I can't see his face, only an arm and the gesture of his thick left hand. It opens in a kind of shrug, hangs briefly in limp sadness, then extends itself in supplication. Gone past, it curls into itself against the car door and is still. I remember when I read this, I thought what was going to happen is not what happened. I thought this driver might be aggressive, might be making a different kind of gesture to this man. Um, here the, the, the cut, the woodblock is much more representative. There's the station wagon, there's that hand, there's the badger, there the, the um, sense of the dividing line, huh? interesting between aggressor and the one who has perished, that dividing line, even though this fellow wasn't an aggressor. And the trees again. So this, this book definitely is worth, I can't trust myself to take that tire tread out the back. I would spill the whole thing, but um, it will be there for you to look at. And this is the last then. This book is called Ephemera, and it's by Karen Kuntz, and she is the artist who is profiled in the Sherry Grover Gallery now, and I believe her um, work will be profiled until the end of May. She is a professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and has taught workshops around the world. 
Her work as an artist printmaker finds influence from her Nebraska heritage and the landscape of the plains, but also from um, her meditative um, devotion to issues such as endurance and vulnerability. In Ephemera, publisher Blue Heron Press wrote, in words and images, micro to macroscopic layers of poignant meaning and memory are an intimately held in transient, entrenchant wonder. Just as light melts repto and verso printing into one light born envelope. The book's line drawings from uh, photopolymer plates were printed letterpress, and the woodcuts were printed from birch blocks on an etching press. In this book, um, Kuntz chose to work with two poems by former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky, and I wanted to share the first one with you. There you go, Catherine. Thank you. We start the title page. Rhyme. Air, an instrument of the tongue. The tongue, an instrument of the body. The body, an instrument of spirit. The spirit, a being of the air. A bird, the medium of its song. A song, a world, a containment, like a hotel room ready for us guests to inherit our compartment of time there. In the Cornell box, among ephemera as its element, the preserved bird, a study in spontaneous elegy the parrot art, mortal in its cornered sphere. The room, a stanza rung in a laddered filament, clamored by all the unsteady chambered voices that share it, each reciting, I too was here in a room, a rhyme, a song, in the box, in books, each element an instrument, the body still straining to parrot the spirit, a being of air. And that's all I think we'll stop then.